Welcome back to another edition of the Night Report Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Broadbent. Joining me once again is my co-host, Richie O'Leary. Uh, some bad news was delivered today. Uh, Shiano had a uh, non-taped presser after practice. He announced that Sam Brown is, in fact, out for the season. Shouldn't surprise if anyone saw that injury. Uh, obviously, it was pretty gruesome. So I think Richie posted a video, but they didn't show a replay on TV for a reason. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to get into some recruiting talk uh, about football. We're going to talk about a uh, some basketball stuff. Slam Magazine uh, just dropped its newest cover, and Dylan Harper and Ace Bailey are on the cover, so we'll talk about that. The scrimmage tomorrow, we'll preview a bit, and uh, we'll remind you again about the giveaway we're doing. Yes. But before we get into all of that, we are brought to you by Night and Day Apparel. Get ready for football and tailgating season with Night and Day Apparel. Our apparel is designed to keep you comfortable and stylish from the pregame excitement to the final whistle. Whether you're grilling in the parking lot or cheering from the stands, our high-quality gear has you covered with unbeatable comfort and team spirit. Use our promo code RUTGERSRIVALS to get 10% off your purchase. Score big this season and keep chopping with Night and Day Apparel. Ooh, a, lot, a lot of TKR stuff on the front page today. A little dark Pretty side cool. action here. A little yeah. Natty Champs from 1869. So, I mean, and what was the other one? There was another new one. Um, oh, the chop Yeah, one. it's that yeah. chop. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Pretty cool stuff. Um, yeah, I gotta go back on there before the holidays and see what, uh, see what stuff I want to buy myself for Christmas. There you um, go. Buy yourself your own <laughs> gifts. You're one, you're one exactly. of those guys. <laughs> um, this podcast is also brought to you by bet online. Bet online is the world's most trusted betting platform and your number one source for everything football. Bet online is every stat, every matchup, and even live odds and spreads to bet on during games. If you think you know your stuff, get in on our $200,000 mega contest and pick five against the spread each week for your chance at weekly prizes and a share of $200,000. When the game's over, head on over to our online casino and get in on a game of blackjack or poker or unwind with one of 150 slot games. Head to the website today and get in on the action. Bet online. The game starts here. Okay, so unfortunately, Rutgers lost backup Sam Brown to a lower body injury, I think they called it, um, yeah. for the season. Shouldn't surprise. Um, really tough break for Sam Brown, who's dealt with foot injuries, mm -hmm. uh, who looked really promising as a freshman. Finally started, it seemed like he got his burst back this year. And uh, in garbage time, totally like pointless minutes, <clears throat> he unfortunately yeah. goes down for the season. Um, how big of an impact is this going to have on the rest of the season for Rutgers? Uh, I mean, it'll have a little bit of an impact because he had his moments. Um, I think it was that Washington game where it was that big, like, 40-yard run, which it almost looked like he was going to get stopped multiple times and just didn't. Um, but, I mean, just to have a, that veteran experience. He was a third-year guy. Um, it's another veteran down, so it definitely hurts. But the good thing is that Rutgers does have quite a bit of running back depth. Uh, we've seen Antoine Raymond come in, and I'm kind of uh, looking a little bit ahead of what we're going to talk about, but I kind of see him coming in as the replacement. Um, he's been the guy for the first two games, um, of the season. He had 120 something yards, a couple touchdowns in those first two games. And it looked like he was going to play a big role. And then we didn't see him again until this past weekend when Sam Brown went down. Um, so it definitely hurts the team a little bit because Brown kind of gave you a little bit of a different back too. He was more of a power back, whereas they don't really have a guy that's, a, that's his size. It's what was he? Six, one, like two thirty ish. Yeah, he's something big. like that. Yeah, so it, you won't really have another running back in the room like that size. I guess you can argue Gabe Winovich, who's much younger, uh, or a freshman who's a little bit lower down the depth chart. But Antoine Raymond's the guy to watch out for. Um, it sounded like they were going to redshirt him originally. That's why we didn't see him the past three weeks. But uh, it's that's obviously out the door now. Um, that's just not going to happen. Yeah, so I mean, only three running backs so far this season is, have seen a snap. Obviously, Kyle on guy, Sam mm -hmm. Brown, and Antoine Raymond. You assume that Raymond's going to get bumped up a slot. Who do you see coming in and taking that running back three spot? Because I can't imagine they're not going to have a third guy rotating in now. So that's weird. Like, Jayshon Benjamin, you expected to kind of be RB3 this year, but he's been on the injury report every single week so far. Yep. Now, mind you, he was fully dressed last weekend, um, but that doesn't always mean you're ready to go. I think he's more of an emergency back. God forbid you have to get down that low. I think they would put Benjamin in, or you'd probably go Ed Greer. Um, who who saw some snaps in the off season and training camp and scrimmages and all that, uh, but that was mostly as like the third and fourth team guys because um, you didn't expect him to really get that much snaps with with Sam Brown with Kyle Manungai, with um, Jay Sean Benjamin. Obviously, injuries take a toll on this team. 
I've taken quite a toll on this team. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, it's going to be Jay Sean Benjamin probably as RB three, but that's more of an emergency scenario. And if it gets down to that, then, then I would say they're in big trouble. Yeah. He played in, I think seven or eight games last season. Um, mm -hmm. he had a couple touchdowns. He had some big plays. Um, it was a little surprising maybe because he was a little dinged up and, uh, they were maybe yeah. trying to, to redshirt him this year. Um, but I, I don't see how <clears> that they actually the six games left. If you could find a way to not use him in two and just use him in the, like mm -hmm. four of the last six, that would work out too. Because it would be a shame for him to lose his red shirt after not playing half a season, basically. Um, That's the plan, I think. Mm -hmm. It's a red shirt Benjamin and let Raymond get all the snaps this year. And, well, RB2 snaps this year. Yeah. Bummer of an injury. Um, there was a bunch it's, of other guys who got dinged <laughs> up on Saturday. Shiano didn't say any of those guys were out for the season. So I think mm -hmm. it's safe to say at the very least they're expected to return at some point this year at the moment. Um, the, the line for the Rutgers uh, UCLA game has been dropping. Uh, it opened at six and a half and I believe as of yesterday, it was down to four and a half. Let me check uh, to see if that's dropped even further, but <laughs> do you think all these injuries are playing a role in this line dropping? Uh, I'd say 100%. I mean, Sam Brown was a very capable back. But like Kyle Nongai, as much as you love him as a running back, as much as you'd love to have him out there as, uh, as much as you can, but um, you can't. Like you, These guys need breaks at times. Yeah. Um, so you do need an RV too, and I think that definitely plays a line in the – plays a role in the line dropping. Also, um, I mean, between Tyreen Powell was linebacker one this season. Going into the season, he would missed last week. Or Robert Longer being missed last week, like – all these injuries. Aaron Lewis played five snaps. Like yep. Kenny Fletcher missed the game half the uh, half the game last week. It, it, it all plays a factor. Add in Sam Brown now after the season. I think that's why you're. Would you say one and a half now? Uh, so it, it's down to four and a half. Four and a half. It, it opened at yeah. six and a half and it's dropped two points since. So it's essentially just the home bump advantage or whatever. Basically, yeah. Yeah. So it's and that's not a good UCLA um, team, man. It's it's not. But UCLA, if you look at who they played, it's been a murderer's row. I think it's, it's been true. basically all ranked teams uh, minus Minnesota last week, and they mm -hmm. put up a good fight against Minnesota. Um, so this is going to be a tough out. It's not a you know, I don't think there's any team in the Big Ten that if you don't play well, you're you're going to beat at this mm -hmm. point. You saw that last week was with okay. Purdue against Illinois. Illinois, you know, I think they're up by like 27, and the game goes to overtime. Mm -hmm. Can't take your foot off the gas on anybody, and you can't just sleepwalk through any game. Um, Rutgers found that out last week when they sleptwalk through a Wisconsin team who was middle of the pack, and they got their doors blown off. That's going to happen each week. If you if you don't show up to play in the Big Ten, regardless of the opponent, you're going to get your doors blown off. So, Yep. So it's uh, not looking pretty, but um, we'll wait and see what the injury report says on Saturday. Yep. Um, let's talk some football recruiting. You had some interesting questions that were asked in the ask the threat ask the staff today that you figured mm -hmm. would uh, be better answered in long form than yes. uh, just answering on the, the board so what were some of the questions that stuck out to you that you wanted to touch on today uh before i touch on the the big one that's really in depth um caleb singleton 2025 db is scheduled to visit florida this weekend found out he actually visited florida back on september 14th as well for their game against texas a&m mind mm -hmm. you staff staff knew about it so Stay remain committed. They still want him, obviously. So it's not one of those those situations where it's like he's lying to the staff and then telling him he's not going and then going. Mm -hmm. Wink, wink. Um, so they they know that Florida is pushing for him. So it's going to be interesting. He is a Florida kid. At the end of the day, we always know Florida recruitments aren't sealed until they actually sign the dotted line. Um, so I think it's going to be tough. He also took an official visit to Florida, and I don't know mm -hmm. if you remember back on our uh, one of our podcasts in June. Uh, when we were talking about him visiting, uh, I mentioned Florida a million times. It sounded like Florida was the leader a million times. So this is going to be a tough one to keep, in my opinion. We'll have to wait and see what happens there. But he will be on campus again this weekend for Florida. And he plans on making another visit for one of the practices as well. So it's not a good look. So can we talk about that? Like, Shiano seemed to be pretty <clears throat> stern with his, you visit elsewhere, you're not committed. But mm -hmm. there's been a lot of guys visiting elsewhere this season, and they're staying committed. What's the deal with that? I think it's... It's more of like, for example, the Braxton Kyle one. Like, if Georgia wants him, I, I can't say. If you're a Georgia kid, how do you say no to that? Yeah. It sounds like more like he went on the visit. He realized he was a little bit down the board. 
and then Rutgers talks to him and uh, he's like, all right, I'll, I'm not visiting anymore. And any other schools, blah, blah, blah. I'm done. I'm locking it in. Who was the other <laughs> one? Michael Clayton. Michael Clayton went to South Carolina. Um, went there, talked to some guys. I think it's also a little bit of negotiating as well. I think yeah. every, every kid Leverage, has NIL. Yeah. yeah. So now it's like, okay, now South Carolina just told me X amount. Uh, I know you were promising me this amount. Can you get this amount and match it now? And end of the day, NIL is involved with 99% of these recruitments now. Yeah. Whether you're a three-star, four-star, five-star. Hell, I've heard about two stars getting NIL. We're talking about like FCS transfers getting NIL. Like it's it's crazy. So every kid just wants money. So a little bit of leverage right there. But um, it's not a coincidence that like, who was it? Yeah, Michael Clayton. Like he came to campus the next week. Like, all right, come on, come back up. We'll, we'll talk. We'll talk in person. All right, there you go. Simple as that. So um, same thing with Braxton Kyle. Came to campus this past weekend after visiting Georgia. All right, we'll talk in person. Um, this one's a little different because he's a Florida kid. Florida has NIL. We know Florida's been high on his list from the beginning. Uh, and also, they're not just going to drop these kids. Now, Keenan, if, for example, lied to the staff about visiting, went in the yep. visit anyway. So that's a one situation where it's like, that's just ruins culture. Like, it's like, you don't trust the kid anymore. All yep. right, see you. I got four other DBs. Like, and at this point, I can just go hit the portal for a DB because that's one of the positions they've been very, very good at finding. So I, uh, it's different for every kid. Every recruitment is completely different when it comes to NIL. But it is uh, something to monitor going forward. Yeah, it's just a, a a weird developing situation, and I assume that each while he does have that rule in place, each kid is kind of handled differently. Yeah, um, like you can't afford to lose a six four, three hundred pound, probably going to be a four star soon in Braxton Kyle at defensive tackle. Yep. But you can afford to lose a DB because you can find DBs anywhere. Skill positions grow on trees. Big, big uglies in the trenches that perform at that level, at that, at that high of a level, at that high, big of a high school, don't grow on trees. Those guys are like hard yep. to find. <laughs> so, yep, totally agree. Um, let's move on to something a little more upbeat. Um, like I previously said, uh, the two freshman phenoms for the Rutgers basketball team. Um, we kind of knew this was coming, and I say kind of. We, we talked about mm -hmm. it, but the the cover was released today. Slam Magazine uh, has Dylan Harper and Ace Bailey on the cover of their next edition of the magazine, which I don't know when that actually hits newsstands. That's a good question. But I have the cover looks like here. This is fucking awesome. This That's is cool. such a huge thing. Like as somebody who grew up reading Slam Magazine, Sports Illustrated, all those mm -hmm. kind of quarterly slash weekly magazines, this is like such a cool moment just to see two of our guys on the cover. Um, this is the gold edition. I think you can. there's like 94 of these printed. I think you could buy one um, online on their website for $94, or something like that. So um, weird. Yeah. limited edition. They have a lot of cool gear on there from the uh, from the shoot. Um, these are also available at Scarlet Fever starting yes. tomorrow, today? I believe. Today, okay. Oh, yeah, I think they posted them today already. They did post it, but if you don't want, if you want to support, obviously, a Rutgers brand, uh, and if you also don't want to wait because these, True. you know, have to get shipped, you can go to Scarlet Fever um, ahead of the game, even tomorrow, which we'll get into in a second, and. Uh, sport some some fancy new some fancy new Rutgers gear um additionally they have a bunch of stuff on their website that's really cool too and I apologize to a night and day our sponsor but I have to share this so like I said they have the the magazine here the regular edition you can get online for 12 bucks mm -hmm. if you can't get to a newsstand they have the gold edition which is number 94 for 94 bucks and they got the shirts and hoodies and not hoodies, uh, crew neck sweaters. And they got some really cool t-shirts on here too. Look at this one is gorgeous. Run, Rockers, run. Yeah, that's a beautiful shirt. I already ordered that one. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> but okay. some cool stuff. Um, and then there's one other thing from the shoot that I thought was cool. It's, uh, maybe a little embarrassing, but it's all right. Um, so Steve from Scarlet Fever said he had to wait until slam dropped the cover. Okay. Sell them, so they should be available. They're on his website as well if you can't get there, RuckersFever.com. 
All right, sorry if this is loud. Hopefully it's not so loud. It's fine, but it's fine. I call it me that was Dylan and Ace singing iCarly before yeah. the photo shoot um, that the uh, Rutgers men's basketball account tweeted out. Um, but anyway, super cool moment for the program. It's only going to be building more hype for Rutgers basketball. Gives a ton of uh, notoriety to the program ahead of the season, um, which kind of is a soft launch tomorrow. The yeah. scrimmage between Rutgers and St. John's uh, is tomorrow at 6.30 p.m. There's still tickets available in the 200s and 300 section. Those mm -hmm. tickets are $10 each. All proceeds from the scrimmage go to the Jimmy V Foundation, a great cause, and um, 10 bucks. How, you're not going to find another opportunity to uh, get into a Rutgers basketball game at the rack this year for $10. And they're playing another top 25 team. I believe St. John's came in in the AP poll at like 21. Um, check real quick. But it's a big time matchup. Both teams are going to be playing hard. This is, you know, they don't get real preseason, you know, college sports don't get real preseason games. And this is the closest thing you can get to a preseason game. Um, first time you're going to see these guys in real uniforms with real referees, the real crowd. So um, be there and be loud. Um, 630 tip tomorrow. It's going to be also, if you're not in the area, it's also going to be on BTN. Yes. Um, so it's going to be on national TV as well. But um, yeah, if you can get there, do it. 27 technically. Okay. So they're 27th. I think, yeah, yeah I think Mark Torvik and uh, I mean, they're very good team. Both have them. Yeah, they're, they're a good team. Um, bottom line. One of the better teams Rutgers will face all season, probably. So mm -hmm. great test early on. Plays a different style than what you're probably going to see in the Big Ten. Kadari Richmond's already talking shit. Yeah, I saw talking that. about how he can't about? wait to you know beat Rutgers again, start his, career, his season off one and zero. Like, bro, we just dog walked them I, last I year. I was going like, to say, even about? in Rutgers' down year, mind you, last year they dominated Seton yeah. Hall. So <laughs> confused about that one, and there's no logic. Yeah, um, what are you, what are you looking forward to most? for tomorrow's scrimmage? I think this is going to be a good opportunity. And I know people that went to the, the, the Rutgers on Rutgers scrimmage, the knighthood showcase, I think it was called, um, and got to see a little bit of the big men. But I want to see Emmanuel Ogbo, Lathan Somerville go up against a legitimate big man. Not their yeah. own team, not their own scrimmage, because I want to see how they perform against a top, not maybe not top tier big man, but they have a solid lineup in St. John's. Um, so I'm really intrigued to see how they can perform when it comes down to actual fouls being called with the actual referees, like, cause Emmanuel Ogbo, the, the jury's still out on him at the end yeah. of the day, until we see something from him, it's still out and we need to see something productive. We need to see some kind of improvement. Now I do think he'll be improved based on what we've seen in practices and stuff, but I need to see a significant jump and I'm not asking him to do a, a lot. I just need solid defense. Solid on the rebounds. Need you to box the hell out because you have the size advantage on almost everyone you face just about, or muscle advantage, I guess you could say. Strength, whatever. Um, so I need to see how he performs against a legitimate big man. And Lathan Somerville, we know Ace and Dylan are going to be the two guys, uh, two freshmen that are going to lead the team in probably scoring every game. I need to see something out of Lathan to prove that he could maybe take over that spot if Emmanuel Ogbo is not ready, whether it be midseason, whether it be late season, whether it be early season even. I need to see something out of Lathan to prove that he can perform at this level, at a high level, early on. Yeah, totally agree. I would love to see how he handles, you know. Uh, I, didn't St. John's get a big-time uh, transfer? I, for, in it. I forget what their lineup is, to be honest. All right, I'm going to look that up. Um, because I thought they – I know they got, obviously, Katari Richmond. They, spent, they spend a shit ton of money because vitamin yeah. water just funds their NIL department, <laughs> which is crazy. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so Bartorik has them at 16th. They have Rutgers at 18th. Um, they have Vincent. Oh, that's a lot of letters. I'll, I'll pull up the roster here. Jeez. I've got to renew my uh, my annual Ken Palm subscription too. Um, so Kadari Richmond's obviously expected to be their top player. Um, RJ Lewis is one of the the top returners for them. Simeon Wilcher is a transfer in, I believe. No, he, he decommitted from UNC and came on for last year. Yes. Um, 
Their big man is listed at 7-1. Vincent Uchuku. 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 That sounds that's guess, pretty good. 7-1, yeah. 240. USC transfer. USC transfer. Okay. Southern Cal Academy. Another uh, Rutgers stomping ground. Look at that. Um, so, yeah. Bartorvik has uh, four guys that are predicting for almost 10 points a game in RJ Lewis, Aaron Scott, Evian Smith, and Kadari Richmond. Mm-hmm. Um, the Iwu offensive rating is all pretty high Chukwu. for that team as well. Yeah, you were right. Yeah, Iwu Chukwu. And then you see you have Rutgers here at 19th. I said 18th, so sorry about that. Mm-hmm. Um, just to give you an idea of where they expect the Rutgers offensive efficiency to sit. I'm most excited just to see how these rotations end up shaking out. Because there's a lot of like hypotheticals right now, us kind of speculating on, you know, who's going to be the starting lineup, who's going to be the first guy off the bench, how, you know, is, is he going to play small ball? Is he going to have three guard lineups? Yeah. I think this is still something that Pykele needs to figure out. I don't think he has a solid answer, which is not a bad thing. Like, it's just, he hasn't seen these guys, you know, under, you know, with live bullets flying out there yet. So I think if I had to guess, Tyson Acuff would be the first guy off the bench. Um, followed by PJ Hayes and Jordan Durkak. Mm-hmm. Um, well, that's if Acuff's fully good to go too. Yeah, I you know I've heard a lot of mixed things about that. I've heard from some sources that he's ahead of schedule, but when I saw him, you know, in the the, the media scrimmage, he was just off to the side doing one on one stuff. It, he wasn't doing anything basketball related. It was all like stretching and you know running and things like that. So that's not to say that he hasn't made progress because that was you know, a month ago at this point. So, um, I don't know. I, if I, if I had to guess gun to my head, starters are going to be Jeremiah Williams, Dylan Harper, Zach Martini, Ace Bailey, and my boy, probably I bully, but it wouldn't surprise me at all if they go to PJ Hayes, just to yeah. kind of do a small ball style yeah. lineup with a lot of shooting, uh, around two studs. But, These numbers are interesting too, because that's 70, Five points per game, if I did the math right, something like that. A little more than that, maybe. Um, um, it's a significant yeah, increase like from last year, who averaged sixty-five. And like, when's the last time a Pikel team averaged seventy plus? I don't think it's ever happened. Yeah, so that's that's, <laughs> that's where it gets interesting because he's yeah. never had offensive players like this, to be honest. So he never did it at Rutgers, actually. So yeah, this is a, a unique team for sure. So very excited to see that team in person tomorrow. I, it honestly would not surprise me if it's a sellout um, or very, very close to a sellout. I know mm-hmm. 6.30 on a Thursday in October, oh, yeah. maybe not the easiest uh, commute for everyone, but it's still a, still a pretty rare opportunity that we're going to have um, to see this team. Route 18, 287 are going to be hell. Yep. Route one, like anything, anything you use to get into New Brunswick, it's going to be hell. Yep, as it usually is. Um, yeah, not great, not great. Is there uh, anything else that we forgot before we uh, do our? Uh, yeah, we technically skipped that other question for football recruiting. Oh yeah, yeah. Sorry about that. Yeah, Let's get no. back to that. All right, rewind. Um, so this is an interesting one. This is from our user. What's his name? Are you seven five eight zero? And you kind of pointed out a lot of things from uh, the recruiting front, but I'm just going to go to the gist of it. The ba- basically, the question is, is why is Shiano's program so good at developing under-recruited kids and so bad at retaining slash developing the highly rated kids? He used examples as Logan Ryan, Anthony Davis are exceptions, made the NFL great. Obviously, McCourty brothers were under-recruited, made the NFL great. But then you have a list of a bunch of four stars that just haven't panned out, especially in the 2.0 era between Elijah mm-hmm. Clark, transfer Kyrie Benton transferred I don't even know where he's at Gavin Wimsett transfer Moses Walker hasn't really done much until this year and even then he's struggling Anthony Johnson kicked off the team Sam Brown injury prone Jacob Allen medically retired Kenny Fletcher defensive end tight end now also injured yeah I think there's a couple different ways that you kind of have to look at this the first is that not all four stars are created equal Mm-hmm. When you compare just some of the guys in that list, let's just say we're talking Anthony Davis, who his finalists were like Rutgers, Ohio State, and somebody else. I, I know it was the final two of Rutgers and Ohio State mm-hmm. versus guys like, I don't know, Anthony Johnson, who had a finalist of like Rutgers, Maryland, Boston College. 
I think it's more important to see what programs are trying to land players over what they're ranked recruiting wise, because there's been plenty of high three stars that Rutgers has had to battle it out for, for against the, you know, like look at Braxton Kyle, right? Mm -hmm. He's got offers from like everywhere, but he's a high three star. And I would take him over a bunch of four stars in the area just because, you know, he plays tougher competition. He's got these big schools that really want him, maybe not really want him like a Georgia, like Georgia, he's down on their list, but he still mm -hmm. has an offer. Um, that to me is pretty telling. The other is guys get these ratings oftentimes several years ahead of when they actually arrive at college. A lot of things can happen between now and then. Yeah. They usually get these ratings after camp performances too. Now, a guy can look really good in these one-on-one -on -one shorts and t-shirt drills, but mm -hmm. look totally different when they actually get on the gridiron and have to play football. I'm thinking no further than a few years ago when there was a kid from Camden I think Woodrow Wilson, who was committed to Maryland. He was a four-star. He was a top five in the state. And in his senior year, he was having a bad year. Mm -hmm. He ends up getting dropped by Maryland and he can't find a single FBS program to take him. He ends up at Campbell down in North Carolina while yeah. he was still a four-star. So it just kind of goes to show that like ratings aren't necessarily everything. They're a good guiding, they're a good guiding uh, principle or a guiding, um, you know, just something to guide you as to how good relative, relatively a player is, but it's not gospel mm -hmm. by any means. Um, and I think a lot of the four stars that Rutgers typically lands are like plan B type kids for the bigger programs in the area. So yeah. if all these bigger programs have kind of passed on a kid, and that's not a blanket statement by any means, mm -hmm. but generally speaking, um, like Moses Walker was an exception where we beat out Penn State for him. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we landed a DJ McClary from Penn State. Like, I think you kind of have to look at what schools are really pushing for a kid when you land them, not necessarily what their rating is. And that's just my opinion. That's fair. I mean, there's, you kind of just said it. Like, it's looking at those kids, like Elijah Clark. Uh, who did they beat? I don't even know who they beat out for Elijah Clark. Uh, but South Jersey kid, Fran Brown connection. So you need connections most for most of these four stars, number one. And number two, like you said, most of the regional schools, like if they're not going to want them, like their backup option to Moses Walker was Abdul Carter, who's pretty yep. good in his own right. Um, for every like Rutgers four star they get, like there's like Alabama and Georgia and all these guys have like a million other four star options, five star options even. And like looking back at some of his his uh, recruiting like calls for Shiano, maybe not recently, uh, but Anthony Davis, four star produced, like Savon Huggins didn't produce Tom Savage. I would argue produced it just, there was a mess up with that whole thing. He still ended up being an NFL quarterback in multiple years. Chris yep. Muller, pretty <laughs> damn good. Um, D'Antoine Williams didn't work out. Marquise Wright, meh. Manny Abreu worked pretty well. I thought he was solid. Um, Elijah Clark, Tyshawn Fogg had some ups and downs, but overall was a multi-year starter. Like he was Nash kid though. Yeah, oh, you're right, actually. I take it back. Leonta Carew didn't really technically play for Greg, so it didn't count. Yeah. Kenny Fletcher, Anthony Johnson kicked off. Moses Walker, J.J. Denman. These kids actually, <laughs> a lot of these kids actually didn't play for Greg now that I think about it. <laughs> yeah. Um, but there is some success stories, too, because, like, Kaj Sanders this year has looked phenomenal. As a, like, he doesn't look like a freshman out there. Antoine Raymond looks pretty damn good so far. Yeah. Yeah. Um, He's also had some misses though too. Like Brandon, like uh, Amarion Brown never made it to campus. Jacob Allen, that's just shit luck. Gavin Wimsett, I, I could have told you in high school it was inaccurate, but it's besides the point. Um, there's ups and downs. Like like even I'm trying to think. Kyrie Banton just didn't work out. Yeah, you know what? It it is a lot. Corey Duff looks pretty good so far. So mm -hmm. you just gotta. I wouldn't say the 2.0 era has been struggling with them. I think it's just a kind of a lot of bad luck with most of these guys too. Like Sam Brown, injury prone, Jacob Allen, injury prone. Like a lot of these guys yeah. have just been suffering injuries <laughs> or they've been stupid think, like Anthony Johnson and you get kicked off the fucking team. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, it's, it's a relatively small sample size. And <clears throat> if you look at recruiting as the average three star has like a 40% hit rate. The average four star mm -hmm. probably only has like a 50% hit rate. It's not a huge bump. Yeah. So like looking through some of the players that we have committed, like Nikki Wynn, I mm -hmm. think is, should be a four star is, is a four star caliber player. 
Mm-hmm. So many schools wanted him. There's still schools after him. Rutgers has done a great job keeping him, but he is a super, super high level kid. It wouldn't surprise me at all if he is on the two deep as a true freshman next year. Um, mm-hmm. you look further down the list, Jayon Simon would be stud. a four star if he played in New Jersey. He's a total mm-hmm. stud. Um, or any other high school. <laughs> yeah. There's just not, like I said, not all, not all three stars or four stars are created equal. Mm-hmm. So I think it's more important to see what, not only what schools were like finalists, but also what schools are still trying to land a kid, even though he's committed to you. Um, it's but also in, evaluations at the end of the day too. Like the staff turned around, yeah. turned, uh, turned off. Or I can't even think of the word turned away. There we go. Can't talk today. Yeah. Turned away a bunch of highly ranked kids that wanted to commit. And it's about culture mm-hmm. fit. And it's about the eye test, the eyeball test. Like you need to be able to see what this kid's future looks like. And I, I think they've been pretty damn good at judging what a kid can look like in the future. I mean, look at, I know he's struggling a little bit right now, but Jabome was a kid that barely played any football in his entire life. And now he's a starting linebacker. Is he supposed to be? Probably not. He's supposed to be on the two, but he's supposed to be on the two deep at least. And yeah, it's pretty good for a second year guy. And I think there's so many factors that go into whether a kid is successful or not. You know, let's first talk about injuries. If that's you can right. successfully yeah. avoid major injuries as a, as a football player, that's huge. Mm-hmm. Um, how well you adapt to college in terms of, you know, the, the weight, weight training, being away from your family for the first time, like mm-hmm. it's mentally tough on a lot of these kids and some kids just there's kids on the team right now who haven't had like that breakthrough in the weight room until like this year and they're in th- year three or four. So mm-hmm. sometimes that takes an adjustment. Um, you know, as these kids do get older and their bodies change, they have to change positions sometimes. And maybe mm-hmm. they're not the same player that they were in high school as, you know, let's just say as a stud, let's just, safety and they outgrow safety and they move down the linebacker where they don't have the physicality to play linebacker. Like there's a lot of things that can just change or not work out based on factors totally off, off the field. Mm -hmm. So I think you have to take that into account um, when you're talking about guys developing or not, but I do agree. Generally speaking, there haven't been enough hits on the development side for Shiano 2.0. But I, I don't think they all fit neatly into like a box, if I had to say. Um, and I think the 24 class is the most talented that he's landed in his 2.0 era. And That's the 25, right. once they get on the campus, will supplant them as the number one ta- most talented class that he's landed so far. Mm-hmm. So there is more talent coming into the program, but they need to actually show the ability to develop that talent into useful depth because that is where they have failed so far. I mean, Brian Felter is a perfect example of this case. Like he was a highly ranked kid. I know he wasn't a four star. I think he was a high three star. I think if he had a little bit more size, he would have been a four star. Um, but he's a kid that started his, or I don't even know if he started year one, but he played a lot year one and then was non-existent. And then all of a sudden became a starter again last season and was arguably one of the best line that I should say lineman number two behind Holland Pierce in the past two years, past mm-hmm. season and a half, whatever. And now he's the leader in all the weight room categories, like for offensive linemen, like, the dudes went from highly ranked recruit to nothing potential transfer watch, to be honest with you, to full-time starter. Um, and that's development. Like you got to develop some of these guys. Um, but there are a lot of misses. There's been a lot of misses, the offensive line specifically, wide receiver room specifically. There's been just miss after miss. Like it's not good and they need to fix that, um, especially in year five. It's year five now. Like you got to – you can blame COVID all you want for that one year. And that's where that 2020 class comes into play or 2021 class, I guess. Um, so it was harder to recruit, harder to get eyes on kids. They're not at camps. They're not doing anything. But 2021, 2022, 2023, someone's got to produce out of those three classes like that, or do something. Listen to the – so the, the class of 2020 ended up being hugely successful for Shiano and company. Just – this is mm-hmm. the heater that Shiano went on when he got hired – because yeah, I think he got hired like the first week in right? yeah in December. Here are the players that he landed in order of uh, the calendar when he was hired as coach: mm-hmm. Victor Kanapka, Tunde Fotokazi, Chris Long, Max Melton, Robert Longerbeam, Tyreen Powell, Cedrice Pellant, uh, Troy Rainey, Kyle Manungai, Wesley Bailey, Renee Conga. Those are the guys that he landed within two weeks of getting hired. Yeah, that is insane. All those guys ended up being, for the most part, hugely impactful. Um, but he just hasn't had that same luck with his subsequent classes. 
Uh, if you just look at what's happened between 2021 and 2023, um, so those guys 20, have 2020 signing day was like right before COVID, right? So that was the 19th, 2019 yeah, signing so, day, right? Um, so COVID would have been like five months after that. After that signing sounds, day, yeah, that sounds right. Yeah, yeah, because that was Four we months, got hired in December of 19, March? and COVID oh. started in March of 20. Okay, yeah. March. Yeah. So I mean, yeah, that next class, and then it's just. <laughs> that class is bad. <laughs> yeah, 21, they have a handful of guys that ended up making an impact. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, twelve. Twelve. Twelve of the 22 commits are transferred, and a lot of them are just not in the two deep either. Like, this is... Yeah. It's a bad class. Like, we got Needham, we got Zelinskis, we got Igbenusen. We got uh, Shaquan Loyal, Keontae Hamilton. So you got five starters out of this class. Elijah Clark probably would be a starter if he was here still. Yeah. And then you got a couple of guys who are meaningful depth. Um, we go to 22. Like, Gavin wasn't even part of this class technically, so remember that. Yep. Let's sort it by the date they committed. So that's always interesting. Um. Again, you go through here, a lot of these guys aren't with the program anymore um, or have medically retired or just done nothing. Um, yeah. Like you Not just can't – you can't have classes like this where you get very few guys who actually get on the field. Um, like transfer too deep, medically tired, starter, yeah. transfer. <laughs> like This is a little bit better. But like John Stone's not offensive. The fact that he's not center too is wild because I they hyped him up quite a bit. It's mm -hmm. Terrence Salami. Jasir Peterson was one of the highest ranked kids, if not the highest ranked kid in this class, and yep. he's nowhere to be found. Davon Fuse played some as a freshman, nowhere to be found. DeAndre Johnson was a weird take, I thought. Probably transfer watch. Logan Blake, tight end four. Dylan Braithwaite, uh, buried on the depth chart. Ian Strong has been <laughs> one of the he's lowest ranked stud. kids. Yeah. <laughs> it's a stud. <laughs> like, and that's uh, that's exactly geez. what I'm talking about because Ian Strong was a guy that every time you saw him play, mm -hmm. he was just making play after play. He's got the size. He was a guy who had a ton of offers. Like this is a guy who just did not have the correct ranking. Yeah, and, don't blame me for that one. I pushed for it. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, some shitty offers. Yeah, I thought he had more. Maybe yeah. I'm wrong. But I'm, I could have swore that there was questions he had guys, about his speed. And like okay. he didn't have enough uh, leverage as a wide receiver and separation, and I still pushed for a three-star ranking. I think he should have been at that at least. But all right, that was my bet. I could have swore he had more Again. offers. Um, yeah. Then like anyway. a lot of them are just yeah. Yeah. So twenty-four, I feel pretty damn good about. Um, obviously, a lot of these guys still um, have mm -hmm. to develop as players, but I mean, yeah, they've been here for a year, not even. <laughs> Yeah, but Duff has seen significant time. Sanders has seen significant time. Raymond has seen significant time. Uh, Serace would probably be the backup if he wasn't hurt. Um, mm. You've heard good things about uh, Antonio, Antonio White, White and Gilly. Yeah. Um, yeah. For obviously Ben Black seen significant time. Good things um, about Robinson. Yep, we've heard good things about Robinson. We've heard good things about uh, Edgar Kevin Rear. Levy. Yeah, Kevin Levy just played last week for the first time. Yep. So, so I, I feel good about this class developing. Uh, yeah, hitting hitting more than twenty one through twenty three, but they need more classes like two thousand twenty. Yeah, the end of the day. Interesting um, name there, Isaiah Crumpler has uh, shined a little bit in practice slash camp. So, not not a immediate impact. He's going to be sa he's at safety now, but uh, I do think he'll be a name that you'll you'll remember down the line. Yep. Um, so we'll have podcasts for you the next two days as well. So strap mm -hmm. in tomorrow. We're going to have a preview pod for the UCLA game with, uh, somebody who covers UCLA. I know um, you do. Sack something. Yeah. Um, we're also going to have a podcast Friday, uh, recapping the scrimmage, you know, what we saw, what we uh, thought did went well, what we thought could use some work. Um, and, yeah, so a lot of content coming at you this week. We'll have a live 
post game show on Saturday as well. Yep. Uh, that will be me and Alec, I believe, because Richie has another fall Saturday wedding. I'm so to freak out on someone at this point. <laughs> like it's it's ridiculous. Like I, I'm, you, you just gotta realize that you do this. I'm sitting at the table with my phone in my hand and I'm just watching the game. I I congrats. You. I don't care. Like, say yeah. I do. Let's come on. The game's on. It's, <laughs> it's three o'clock. It's, it's fourth quarter. Yeah. What are we doing? Like, hey, come, say I do. Kiss. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, someone get a picture. Yep. Um, but we have a giveaway that we're doing right now. There's two ways to enter. Um, like we've said multiple times now. The first way, the preferred way, this will get you two entries into the contest. If you go to Apple Podcasts, you write a five star review, and you mention Rucker's Madness, that'll get you two entries. Uh, there's going to be two winners. One will win the Ace Bailey jersey. The other will win the Dylan Harper jersey. Um, they're both high school replica jerseys. They're really cool. They're stitched. They look really great. Um, Richie also bought one for himself of each as well. Oh, um, I maybe I that. shouldn't talk about that. <laughs> no, I don't care. Um, Eventually maybe you'll we'll see him that. in that one day. Yeah. Um, the other cool. way to enter is to comment on any of the YouTube videos that we mentioned Rutgers Madness with the comment of Rutgers Madness. Um, that'll get you one entry, but this is just a way of us showing our appreciation for you guys. Thank you for listening. Thank you for telling friends, writing reviews, all, all those things. We really do appreciate it. Um, we couldn't have done it without all of you guys to help the channel grow and you know continue to get better guests and better prizes and things like that. But for me and Richie, this has been another edition of the Night Report Podcast signing off.